there isn't any money, therefore you can't get any cash, and you cannot cash a check. And it makes no difference if 300 million people in America say that they can. The fact is, you can't. Why? There isn't any cash there. Why? Because our system is a credit system. Credit and cash are not synonymous. Credit is the primary. In fact, it is the only component of this socialist, centrally planned economic system. This is not a system of free enterprise. So stop defending free enterprise. No one alive has ever lived in a free enterprise system. Now, when we go to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, 1990, we find a little embellishment to this definition of free enterprise. Same case, this being Lafayette Dramatic Productions versus Ferenc, but they embellish upon it just a little bit. I guess I'm going to come to that on the other side of this break. On the other side of the break, I had taken the definition of free enterprise. That was the entire definition, by the way, from Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition. One simple sentence. Boy, I like simple definitions, don't you? They're the best kind. But we're going to go to the 6th edition of Black's, 1990. They're going to quote from the same case, and here's what they're going to say. Free enterprise, the right to conduct a legitimate business for profit. Now, that's where the sentence used to end. Now they've removed the period. They've inserted a comma, and they said now, under usual laws of supply and demand, without undue government influence. I like to emphasize those words, usual and undue. Those are qualifiers, aren't they? You see, we've come to accept in America government interference. It's just the undue government interference that we don't want, however you define that. And you know, there are a lot of complaints about the free enterprise capitalist system that are going around in America, and they're being espoused by people who are avowedly socialist. But what they're complaining about is not America's free enterprise economic system. That was abandoned a long time ago. In fact, it was probably abandoned probably after Andrew Jackson, at least in part. Now, it's been a progressive thing. But since 1965, America has had no money in circulation. And we've had a monopoly of fictitious money creation centered in the Federal Reserve Bank itself. America replaced the Ten Commandments of God. It replaced the Constitution and constitutional and biblical money and instead put in place the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto, the fifth plank being centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a central bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. That's the Federal Reserve System as it currently exists in America. What people are complaining about is not free enterprise. They're complaining about communism. The only thing is the average American doesn't know he lives in a communist country, and we've been exporting communism around the world for decades. Now, is banking a legitimate business for profit, according to the likes of Mr. Thorne and Mr. Warner? Well, evidently. Let's read on from rule number three in their six rules of monetary law in a free society. Quote, the national treasury shall service the financial needs, okay, that's debt, finances debt, see, the financial needs of the private sector with loans. Loans of what? Absolutely nothing. You remember they said that the government was going to be able to write good checks, these are their words. They're going to write good checks against no funds. Those are their words. I can't believe that you've actually got two engineers who would dare to put that in print. But by golly, they did. The National Treasury shall service the financial needs of the private sector with loans of an appropriate minimum amount to banks. Okay? So they don't, they don't mind banks. Are banks operated as a business for profit? You bet your sweet bippy they are. Is the Federal Reserve our central bank? In business for profit, you're darn tootin'. Can you open up a bank to compete with them? Has anyone else ever done so in the last 99 years since the Federal Reserve was created? Uh-uh. You see, monopolies, and that's what it is, monopolies are diametrically opposed to free enterprise. And so is theft. Even if government is the only party which licenses itself to steal from a so-called free enterprise, private sector economy. But you see, Americans today accept a double standard where government can do what you cannot. Thomas Jefferson did not accept that. Nor does the Constitution. Nor does the Bible. Remember, tyranny is defined as that which is legal for government, but illegal for the citizenry. It was Louis D. Brandeis 
the United States Supreme Court Justice from 1916 to 1939, who said in one of his cases that he uh, ruled and wrote the opinion. I forget the name of the case now, but I certainly remember the quote. Government must obey the law scrupulously, for when it fails to do so, it breeds contempt for law and order. Isn't that what happened in ancient Israel when the kings of our forefathers would cause the Israelites to sin? like Omri, for example, and the people followed the statutes of Omri, and God was wroth with the people because they obeyed the state. Why? Because the statutes of Omri were unrighteous. Now, in our previous message, we pointed out how many of our important national debates, such as the debate between the gold standard versus no gold standard, are rendered futile being carried on between opposing factions within the confines of a false paradigm. And we've talked about false paradigms in previous messages. Both sides feed upon erroneous presuppositions to keep the debate well within officially acceptable limits, this being accomplished by simply adopting inaccurate definitions that were created by central banking and then regurgitated by academia and then by media. The result is that both sides wrestle over the wrong issues to arrive at erroneous conclusions and thus offer us their equally absurd solutions. I'll give you a simple example of that. It's found where a liberal politician gets up on the stage and he advocates the spending of more federal money, you know, for social programs. The conservative then mounts the platform to argue for reduced spending and perhaps even a balanced budget when the truth of the matter is that Congress spends no money whatsoever. Zero money in and zero money out. That sounds like a balanced budget to me. What do you think? Uncle Sam steals whatever goods and services are necessary from the few remaining producers we have left in society to supply the demands of recipients who've come to depend on those entitlement programs. Well, greetings and welcome back to this half of Datum Line. And uh, I'm Bruce G. McCarthy, broadcasting from RBN's uh, transmitter uh, across the Internet. And we're all broadcasting from Alice's Wonderland. That's the United States of America, the giant social engineering experiment. You know, I was talking about the, uh, the the balanced budget on the other side of the break and how the, the politicians, you know, the liberals and the conservatives like to argue as to whether we should spend more money or we should spend less money, whether we should balance the budget or we don't have to balance the budget, raise the debt ceiling or not raise the, the debt ceiling. But the fact of the matter is there's no money being spent. And that's important to understand because when you're a government that doesn't spend any money, You can steal whatever you want, so long as you can get people to accept your bills of credit, which are no longer bills of credit by definition, actually, because they don't promise to do anything. After the Kennedy assassination, almost immediately, within days, uh, the Federal Reserve began issuing its first no-promise notes. But we were all busy watching the electronic campfire, the television set. But what I want to get at here is that theft is not a function of money. Government steals what it wants, and you don't use money to steal. You use credit to steal. But now, if there's a listener out there who believes that Congress collects, spends, and wastes money, you simply identify what the substance of that money is. We ought to be able to find it on the periodic chart. Tell me what the money is that's measured in dollars. It must exist in direct proportion to the dollar quantity that's stamped on either the coin, the piece of paper, or in your account somewhere. You tell me what it is, and I'll send you 100 pounds of it absolutely free. Now, as I mentioned in our previous message, we're taught to regard gold as quaint and barbaric, inconvenient and unscientific. In a modern world of computer credit and bank plastic, you understand. Now, this view appeals to an evolutionary mindset. And everybody's been taught evolution in the public school system, haven't they? Uh, And this is where we've come to believe that our generation is more intelligent than any generation that ever preceded it. That's the bottom line of evolution. That's the myth that is inculcated in the minds of our youth. You see, you adults don't know anything. The children coming behind you know so much more because they're more highly evolved. They believe in evolution. Now, this is not only arrogant, but it's dangerous to our own survival. 
because it presumes that nothing can be learned from history or the people who lived through it. And that is absurd. In our last broadcast, I mentioned the protocols of the learned elders of Zion as one source of unsettling information about gold and the gold standard. Economic reformers of the populist, that being the anti-gold persuasion, have drawn certain conclusions from the protocols which they believe justify our abandonment of gold and even silver forever. That's what the bankers believe, particularly the central bankers, that being that we abandon the use of gold and silver forever. So do the populace. So at least they share one thing in common. In fact, it's amazing how much they share in common with the central bankers, who they profess to oppose. Now, two pr principal concerns of the populace and a few others, which we addressed concerning the protocols, were that, number one, certain bankers own almost all of the gold, thereby precluding its future use as money by the likes of us. Second, that the gold standard was imposed as a replacement of our bimetallic gold and silver coinage to hasten our economic demise. Now, while they're correct on point number two, the bankers don't lawfully own, at point number one, what they acquired by unlawful means. So foreclosure proceedings against the Federal Reserve would be appropriate in returning that money to general circulation if and when sufficient critical mass is reached among a public willing to repent of their contractual walk with perpetrators of fraud and theft. But don't hold your breath. Educating a rebellious generation is a very slow task. And now is the time to repent. Now, meanwhile, some of our listeners may not be familiar with the protocols or may be disturbed by the fact that I even mentioned this document from well over 100 years ago, which explains our present state of confusion. So we're going to look to the past. We're going to look back. Now, it was Bill Clinton who said in his inaugural, inaugural address, ours is a generation that does not look back. How true and how sad. Because if we did, we might learn something from history. So a little background is in order to offset the shrill cry of anti-Semitism in regards to what Wikipedia, source of all wisdom and truth, claims has been thoroughly discredited. First, Henry Ford, you know, the guy who gave us the Ford automobile and automated production, uh, all that sort of stuff. Henry Ford was so taken with them that he published all 24 protocols week by week in the Dearborn Independent newspaper early in the last century. Second, they were first written in the late 1800s then translated into Russian in 1905 by Professor Sergei Nilas, a priest of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Then they were translated into English by Victor Marsden, who was a correspondent for the Morning Post on assignment in Russia, who, married to a Russian woman and conversant in the Russian language, witnessed the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 was then imprisoned by the Soviet and later allowed to return to England where this translation was accomplished. Third, although attributed to a Jewish global conspiracy, the protocols are treated as authentic by Henry Macau, Ph.D., who is an assimilated Jew in America. I shouldn't say in America, but on the American continent. In his book, Illuminati, the cult that hijacked the world, in which he validates their contents from countless Jewish sources, which I consider a tribute to his daring honesty on behalf of Christianity, the chief target, and faith which he professes. Four, at least 90% of today's so-called Jews in the state of Israel are not descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel by an angel of the Lord, by way of Noah's son Shem, 
and therefore they are not Shemitic descendants of Shem or corrupted Semitic people, but are in fact Ashkenazi.